Welcome to the 2016 Journal of Experimental Biology Symposium, held in Muren, Switzerland, where 17 speakers were invited by Joel Levine and Daniel Cronauer to speak about the evolution of social behaviour. Social behaviour, where two or more individuals interact in behaviours such as displays of aggression, parenting, construction and even migration, has been a central interest to behavioural neuroscience for decades. However, studies of social behaviour are challenging. Recent advances in several fields, including genomics, machine vision and learning and physiology, have made it possible to begin tackling many questions that will be central to our understanding. There are a variety of themes that we want to cover, but I think for me the most important thing is observing how sociality may have radiated out from a, a, an intracellular genomic context. But for me the most exciting theme is the idea that social life emanates from a single cell and the genome. In my talk, I talked about our work on parental care in, in poison frogs, mostly in South American poison frogs. Um, and the reason we work on poison frogs is because they display a tremendous diversity in parental care strategies. So we have some species where only dads take care of offspring and some species where only moms do this and others where mom and dad are, are biparental and, and they take care of the offspring together. And so what it allows us to do is, is, is nature has done this experiment for us, this manipulation experiment, where they've given us these three different kinds of parental care strategies and we can compare between these three species to try to understand what are the general principles in uh, neural mechanisms underlying parental care. The general principles that we have, have found so far is one is that there's this a specific brain region called the preoptic area that regulates parental care in frogs and this is similar to other systems including birds and mammals and so it looks like even though parental care has evolved many times independently that this brain region the preoptic area seems to facilitate uh, parental care. I described how when animals make decisions about an olfactory environment, um, they make different decisions when they're uh, in isolation as opposed to when they're in groups. So the key mechanisms that I discovered giving rise to collective behavior in Drosophila include uh, interactions which are mechanosensory in nature, which rely on NOMC mechanosensory gene, as well as mechanosensory sensilla neurons that decorate the ends of the legs of a fly and the wings of a fly. We study collective intelligence in a wide range of organisms, from ants to fish to primates, even to humans. Um, but I'm particularly fascinated by groups where individuals are of low relatedness. Mm -hmm. So they're selfish individuals. In the case of ants, for example, you know, they're, they're typically highly related and they're sort of working together for the benefit of the colony. But when we look at groups of birds or fish, often the individuals are of low relatedness. And so they're trying to optimize their own selfish needs, and yet they need to do so within the collective. We have to resort to using mathematical models to understand these interactions. And initially, these models were really inspired by those that have been used in, in chemistry and in statistical physics. So thinking about potentials, so attraction uh, among individuals, or repulsion among individuals, or a tendency to align. So in my talk today, I was um, talking about the intergenerational transmission of paternal uh, and maternal behavior. So I study prairie voles. They're a socially monogamous species, and we're interested in what happens to family dynamics when you have both mom and dad contributing parental care to offspring. Um, so in social behavior, definitely the hormone that we're most interested in is oxytocin. <clears throat> so this is a really ancient hormone. Um, it's made by all mammals, and it is involved both in parental behavior and in pair bonding. And we did find changes in the oxytocin receptor based on the parental care that babies received. There are a lot of implications for human health in understanding the basic neurobiology of social bonding and how that's transmitted, and also how um, the health practices that we engage in uh, can affect these processes. So um, essentially, you know, there are a lot of pathologies of social behavior, things like autism, schizophrenia, um, and until we understand the basic neurobiology of social behavior, we will never understand what goes wrong uh, in some of these syndromes. So in my talk today, I um, basically presented some work that we've been doing over the last few years to develop one particular ant species as a um, model system for behavioral genetics. And we've been developing a few techniques, including uh, automated behavioral tracking that allows us to track individual ants inside colonies over extended periods of time. Um, and we've also been developing uh, 
protocols to create stable transgenic lines, so to be able to knock out certain genes. So, for example, the ants that are, are not able to, to perceive uh, pheromones, um, um, they, they seem to wander off more from the colony, they're less attracted to the nestmates, uh, they're overall less social. The, the best thing ab about the JEB symposium is the diversity of uh, speakers and also the systems that they, that they work on. So we have some people that work on vertebrates and some people that work on insects. And I think in our normal scientific lives, maybe we wouldn't get to interact with these people um, at our normal meetings. And so what JEB has allowed is uh, the, has allowed people to, um, who work on very different uh, topics and very different systems to come together to share their work. And I think that's very special. One of the most exciting and perhaps satisfying features of the meeting so far has been to see the way molecular neuroscience has, has uh, arrived in animals that are not normally considered model systems. We heard a talk by Russ Fernald in which he described using the CRISPR-Cas system in fish. We heard another talk by Daniel Cronauer's uh, talking about the use of this method in ants. And it's, it's just gratifying to understand how much we can now learn about about the brain in these animals it's been a fantastic meeting uh, integrating uh, ideas and thoughts from from so many different areas I mean we started off being told about you know selfish genetic elements and then we we realized that uh, you know ants are behaving in a similar way at this sort of organismal scale um, we're, we're learning about how the brain processes information and how the brain has evolved to you know copy uh, the uh, say song for example from other individuals and so many many different areas where we can uh, where we can get these uh, these ideas integrated this uh, meeting has shown that the, the, there is a lot of underlying physiology computational models uh, that can be applied to social behavior and I, I hope that we can get more of uh, that information into the journal